way back in April, I made a video about the scientists who were propping up some of the conservative claims that COVID-19 just wasn't that big of a deal, including John Ioannidis, uh, who personally I had a great amount of respect for had a great amount of respect for. Because you see, in March, Ioannidis was writing articles suggesting that COVID wasn't a big deal. But by May, he was publishing studies claiming that his data showed it wasn't a big deal. And his studies were sloppy and embarrassing, uh, something that researchers pointed out at the time. But in those early days of the pandemic, so much got lost in the confusion uh, caused by governments who were withholding data, conservatives who were politicizing the issue unnecessarily, and scientists who were struggling to keep up with a rapidly growing world health issue. But now, eight months later, we have a lot more data and we can see exactly how wrong Ioannidis and his colleagues were um, and the harm that they helped cause. In March, Ioannidis made a mid-range guess that the COVID-19 case fatality rate is 0.3%, which uh, he suggested would lead to about 10,000 deaths, a number that he said was so low we wouldn't even notice uh anything other than, oh, this was a particularly bad flu season. In reality, the case fatality rate, which is the number of people who die after they are confirmed to be COVID-19 positive, is currently estimated to be almost 2% in the United States. In reality, we passed 10,000 deaths at the start of April, just two weeks after Ioannidis wrote his article. And in reality, we are at 282,000 dead Americans with no end in sight. Yet, the debate over Ioannidis and his flawed studies continues to rage. I already pointed out uh, one big problem with his primary study. That was the study in which he claimed to have found evidence that the Bay Area was downright lousy with COVID-19, which, if true, would mean that the true infection fatality rate, or IFR, which is the number of people who die from COVID-19, whether they're symptomatic or not, whether they've been diagnosed or not, just if they were infected, uh, that it would make that number insanely low. So in my previous video, I talked about how BuzzFeed Stephanie M. Lee reported that the study was funded by the founder of JetBlue, who was vehemently in favor of Trump's plan to do nothing to close the economy to stop the spread of the pandemic, and who told the world that he befriended Ioannidis and specifically earmarked his donation to Stanford for Ioannidis' study. That was a big red flag, but I didn't mention in my video because I missed it originally that Lee also discovered that subjects for that study, which the study authors claimed were chosen randomly, were actually recruited by the wife of one of the study authors. She emailed her fellow wealthy friends in the Bay Area, offering to test them for free for COVID-19 antibodies, writing, if you have antibodies against the virus, you are free from the danger of A, getting sick, or B, spreading the virus. In China and UK, they are asking for proof of immunity before returning to work. If you know any small business owners or employees that have been laid off, let them know. They no longer need to quarantine and can return to work without fear. Yeah, none of that was true. Nor was it true that the test was FDA approved, as she told her friends that she emailed. Scientists pointed out that this skewed the subjects involved in the study, specifically increasing the chance that people would sign up if they had previously been sick to learn if what they had was COVID. That would artificially increase the number of COVID positive subjects, making the final IFR they arrived at completely useless. I'm bringing all this up now, not just because time has shown us exactly how badly Ioannidis and his study authors fucked up, but also because his friends are continuing to publish hit pieces, trying to redeem him and cast a bad light on the scientists and the BuzzFeed author who have been critical of him. Most recently, Scientific American made the mistake of publishing a piece defending Ioannidis written by Shannon Brownlee and Jeanne Lenzer, two researchers whose bylines were originally omitted from the piece. 
that was a pretty bad oversight considering that unbeknownst to Scientific American, those two people were collaborators of the people they were defending. Conflict of interest aside, the piece was filled with so many inaccuracies, some of which one would be excused for mistaking for lies, that Scientific American needed to go back and add six endnotes explaining how they were wrong. For instance, when Brownlee and Lenzer claimed that it was misleading and wrong for BuzzFeed to state that there was a financial conflict in Ioannidis' original research, uh, BuzzFeed responded by pointing out, we know that Nealman donated $5,000 to the study. He himself acknowledged that the study authors knew about it. And another co-author on the study, biotech investor Andrew Bogan, thanked him for his financial support in one of Nealman's many emails to the Santa Clara study authors during the course of the study. Like, the article itself is 630 words, but the corrections are 445 words. At some point, shouldn't you just delete the post? This is incredibly embarrassing for Scientific American, a publication that I previously had a lot of respect for, much like how I used to feel about Johnny Anides. Uh, I'm happy that they included the corrections, but seriously, how did this get published? Nearly 15 million Americans have been diagnosed with this disease. Nearly 300,000 are dead, and the pandemic is only getting worse. Maybe it's time to stop pretending that conservatives were ever right that this was just the flu and move on to figuring out how to convince those conservatives to stay inside, to wear a mask, and to get the vaccine when it comes out.